present the, the, the basic framework that's in the book. Um, so I'm sure not everyone's familiar with it. Um, this also is a, a discussion of uh, another book we did recently. If your library has to take a look, um, it's Christ Not to Sell. That's <laughs> academic books are. Um, and I'll say more about this, but uh, we had a chance in Boulder to interview uh, publicly up on the stage seven uh, former science advisors, including at the time um, the science advisor of George W. Bush, uh, Jack Marley. And each one of those science advisors uh, wrote, a, wrote an essay for us, a chapter in this book, on their reflections of their time serving the president, going all the way back to Eisenhower, as I said. Um, so I'll talk about that. So, so the, the basic thesis, um, the basic story I'm going to tell you is that the, uh, the, the great man approach to science advice, and usually it is a man in the United States, it is always a man and always a physicist, um, is not necessarily the best way to get good science advice into policy practice. Science advisors can do many wonderful things, um, and maybe it's a, a necessary role to have but it is not uh, a solution to a lot of our conflicts that arise at the interface of, of knowledge and decision making. And I'll talk about that and, and, and present an alternative way to think about that. Uh, uh, so I'll talk about the short, short rise, um, the golden years, which I think is much more mythology than anything else, uh, the long decline, um, but ultimately in the end, um, expertise has a triumph uh, in the advisory system. Um, uh, there is a, an idea that, that policymakers, um, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with this episode, um, this famous episode in the history of science and politics. Um, there's this idea that policymakers are operating with a deficit of knowledge, and if only they had um, some wise counsel on important subjects, they would make much better decisions. And so the antidote to this is the science advisor. Um, there's John Holdren uh, showing President Obama where, where the facts are, I guess. Uh, this is John Schellenhuber, who's standing behind Angela Merkel. Uh, he's her advisor. There's no chief scientist in Germany, but he was her scientific advisor on the issue of climate change. Uh, and the idea is that by implementing a chief scientist, it represents knowledge uh, at the seat of power. Uh, this is a cartoon from uh, the U.S. Uh, it was written during the Bush administration, but you have the truth. It's the federal government over there trying to cover up the truth, and you have the scientist who's representing truth in um, uncovering truth uh, for the scientists. So here's a list of the science advisors to the U.S. President. I'll go through a little bit of the history and tell a few stories um, from this. Um, unfortunately, the, the ones that are in red have have died of the year of their, their death noted. Uh, and we were able to interview almost all of the, the living uh, science advisors, going back to Don Horney, uh, 1964. And these people are, are very impressive, smart, politically astute people. Every single one of them are really impressive, uh, impressive men. Uh, even Don Horney and Ed David, who were in their late 80s and, and, and were sharp, very sharp guys. Uh, unfortunately, John Marburger, he died last year, uh, George Bush's science advisor. When I interviewed him, and he, when he wrote his, um, his chapter for us, he was still serving, still sitting as science advisor to George Bush. Um, and I'd always hoped that he would have a chance to actually be a little more candid than he was able to. Um, unfortunately, whatever stories he was tell, he took with him. Um, John Holdren is the current science advisor. And um, I'm hopeful we're going to get him to Boulder, to our university, um, in the fall, and have a chance to add him to our collection. Um, so those were the, the, the advisors that I interviewed. Here's, here's me with each one of them. And, and I asked them, about, I, it, it was not really a research project, more of a, a, a history type effort. Uh, but I asked them a number of questions that were um, pretty, pretty similar across the board, compared their answers. And, um, we had an article in. Minerva come out on the history. Um, and then this quote resulted. So let's, uh, let's start at the beginning. President Eisenhower, uh, in late 1957, and so let's say that, that, that 
it's important to recognize that the scientific community, really going back um, into the 19th century in the US and the UK, has long strived for power, to be close to power. Um, in the 1920s, the, the National Union of Scientific Workers in the UK um, put together a report proposing a, a much greater role for science and government. In the 1930s, in the US, uh, scientists repeatedly approached government seeking a, a larger role. Um, every time, government said, thank you, but no thank you. We're doing just fine without scientists. Um, so Eisenhower said in 1957 that he had really never given a thought of having a scientist in the policy position. He had um, some advisors, some de facto advisors related to um, the atomic weapons program. Um, his closest advisor on matters related to science wasn't a scientist, was a businessman. It was controversial in the same sense that we have controversies today about science and business. Um, but everything changed when uh, the Soviet Union launched a satellite into space. And one of the early histories is from a PhD thesis written in 1974, um, explains that Eisenhower saw more scientists in the two weeks after Sputnik than he'd seen in the year before. Um, one of the things that Sputnik did was uh, cause a great uh, political outcry for action. Something has to be done. The Soviets are ahead. Um, pretty soon they'll be firing missiles. So one of the things that Eisenhower did uh, was appoint a science advisor. Um, so at long last, after all of these years and decades of the science community demanding a seat at the highest levels of government, they got it. Um, and James Killian was appointed the first presidential science advisor. Um, what's interesting, uh, he was the president of MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was not a scientist. This is something that most scientists don't know. Um, he's widely viewed as the best science advisor. Part of it is mythology, uh, but maybe his training in administration and management was helpful in uh, surviving in a, in a political environment. Uh, but a mythology came out of this, this really this two-week period, this very short period after Sputnik. Um, President Eisenhower assured Dr. Killian he would enjoy wide latitude and action guaranteed access to information in every corner of government. So this fits this vision of the scientists standing above politics and able to weigh in on any topic in any ministry, um, any department of government, um, because the scientist has the facts on their side. This is a cartoon, a political cartoon um, from the time. And that's, I don't know if you can make it out. It's Dr. Killian there with his rod. Don't spare the rod, Professor. And this is the, the disorderly group of politicians. There's the military. And the idea is that the science advisor is going to come in and take charge of our messy democratic process and straighten out the politicians. The reality was more complex. Here he is uh, getting uh, sworn in as the science advisor. They had to rush through this ceremony. The president had very important business to attend to. He was, <laughs> he was due to be in uh, Georgia at Augusta National Golf Course where the Masters was played. Um, and so they rushed to the ceremony and he left. And I say that this is it's an interesting anecdote, but it's also fairly symbolic about um, what Eisenhower really thought about the importance of the science advisor position. So even by 1963, Mr. Wiesner, who was the advisor to Kennedy, uh, he looked back longingly in his writings. Um, explained that Dr. Killian, as the first presidential advisor on scientific matters, rapidly became involved in matters of the greatest national importance, while education, defense, environment, space, and international cooperation. And you see this idea this, this, that the science advisor just floats above and goes from topic to topic and um, must obviously be a Renaissance man to be able to engage in all these topics and provide advice. Uh, this is written, this is from physics, an article on physics today in 2007. Uh, again, really looking back longingly. Um, during the Eisenhower, never before or since have scientists had a firmer influence on the reins of power than direct national policies. Um, and again, this is a, a longing, a, a, a desire for um, the science advisory apparatus to have a firmer influence on the reins of power. I don't think it could be better stated than that. Now, even though uh, in practice the science advisors really never 
had their hands on the reins of power. Um, they did a lot of things, and some of them were very politically useful. This is Don Horning sitting with Lyndon Johnson. He's the first science advisor we, we um, interviewed. And um, he told this great story, um, which obviously uh, was one of his greatest memories of being a science advisor. He said that one day he and his wife were in their kitchen preparing their dinner, and the phone rang. And it was Lyndon Johnson. And the president said, said you know, Don, the, the Korean de delegation's coming tomorrow. I need to give them something. And uh, Don Horning said, well, I'll have to think on that. Um, so he called back the president a little while later and he said, I have an idea. Let's do a joint U.S.-Korean uh, Science and Technology Institute. And that, that was proposed. The Korean Institute for Science still exists today. Very successful. And Warren said, science is a wonderful lubricant for foreign policy initiatives. And while it's important and necessary, it's really not what you tend to think of when you get the idea of science advice to decision makers. Uh, it didn't have to be a science technology institute. It um, could have been an agriculture institute or a manufacturer or, or anything. But the idea is that the science advisor was politically useful in proposing um, uh, some cooperative project. Now, during that time, Science Magazine wrote an editorial. This is 1969, near the end of the LBJ years. It writes, the horny years, did LBJ neglect his science advisor? And an, an article of this sort has been written about every science advisor all the way up till today. If you look on the internet in the last week, you can ask, see commentaries on blogs and elsewhere that ask what happened to John Holdren. Where did it go? Why doesn't the president listen to his advice? Um, it's a common story. So they're, they're useful, but maybe not in the sense that the mythology holds it up to be. Uh, even at the time, this was a political science article that looked at science advice. Uh, which, it, which shouldn't be surprising to students of politics, but perhaps is to some. The fact that the content of so many political decisions has become heavily scientific has not yet produced a transformation or adaptation of governmental decision processes to the scientific model for resolving conflicts of opinion, interests, or power. Go figure. Politics is still political, and we have not figured out how to turn it into the rational scientific process that maybe envisioned by some. So we asked Don Horning, and this is uh, 40 years later, uh, to, to tell us, and I asked all of the science advisors the same question. Uh, and, I, and for those of you who read The Honest Broker, you recognize the language. Uh, I asked, you know, when did you arbitrate on some scientific question or provide some scientific advice on an issue that he was handling? And Dr. Horning told us something that every one of the science advisors told us, that he knew of no example of being called on to arbitrate a scientific question. At no time did the president or his staff come to him and say, uh, these advisors say 2 plus 2 is 4.1, and these other advisors say 2 plus 2 is 3.8. Can you help us settle that? Um, the closest thing that we heard was from Jack Marburger, who was um, President Bush's science advisor, ironically enough who said that, that he, he was asked uh, in the aftermath of the anthrax and letters issue that came up after 9-11, um, that at what level the US Postal Service should radiate mail to kill anthrax force. And he, his story was that they told him that uh, they should turn their dial to eight, whatever, something like that. And he said the US Postal Service said, well, eight is good, we're gonna turn it up to 15. Apparently they were setting mail on fire. So, uh, but that's the closest that we came in all of the science advisors to hearing the science advisor being used to give advice on science, which I thought was an interesting data point. Uh, so things really changed under Richard Nixon. Uh, here's Nixon uh, holding a model of the space shuttle with uh, James Fletcher, who was the administrator of NASA. Uh, Nixon oversaw the, the, the initial approval and development of the space shuttle program, uh, which is ironic given the story I'm about to tell. Ed David, uh, who was Nixon's science advisor, told a story that I've never heard before, and I don't know if it was ever publicly discussed. Uh, you can read that, but the, the basic story is that President Nixon wanted to cancel Apollo 16 and Apollo 17, which were the last two missions to the moon, uh, because he was worried that if something went wrong, it would interfere with his re-election chances in 1972. Um, Apollo 17 in particular was right the month before 
1972 elections. Um, so he told them to cancel it. Um, I often hear, particularly in the context of issues like climate change, my, my natural science colleagues say the laws of physics can't be violated. Politics must bend to the laws of physics. And my response often is the laws of politics have their own reality, and sometimes they're stronger than the laws of physics um, in an important practical sense. And in this case, um, there were issues like launch windows when they were able to, to send up the, uh, the, uh, the mission, and it, Nixon wasn't going to bend. So the job of the science advisor was to figure out how to get around the political realities. And he did. He said that uh, the Apollo mission should be postponed until after the election. Uh, and he convinced them that Apollo 16 was too early, um, too early to be um, have an influence, whatever happened on the on the, moon, uh, on the presidential election. Uh, so there's another role of the science advisor that you don't really think about was to uh, negotiate for science programs uh, with the president because the president was worried about political outcome. So we have Ed David to thank for two additional moon missions. Uh, and so he said, this was Ed David's commentary, he says, this shows you how science hangs by a string in such situations. It illustrates that political thinking is very different from scientific thinking. Anyone coming to the scientific advisory post without considerable experience in politics is in for some rude shocks. Um, so here's a rude shock. Uh, he told another story. Uh, he got a call from Richard Nixon at the White House and said, Ed, yeah, come over here. Um, and at the time, this is when there were the student protests at university campuses all across the United States in opposition to the Vietnam War. A big deal, and it was politically um, hurting Nixon. And, and Nixon was pissed off, as Nixon tended to get. And he told Ed David, Ed, I want you to go back and cut off all the research, federal research funds that are going to MIT. That's it. Had enough of the protests from the liberals at the universities. So this is what David told us. I just sort of sat there dumbfounded because you know enough about the government that it's a completely impossible. So if you wanted to cut the funding, you know, there's no, no knowledge on it, even if you wanted to do it. So I went back into my office, sat down in the office, puzzled about this for a while, and didn't do anything. <laughs> um, and David lost his job. Nixon decided he didn't even need a science advisor. Got rid of him. And this really transformed the position. Um, and it explains why the presidential science advisor practically has never been in the inner circle of presidential advisors, but can, can never occupy that role. So for, for people who think, and you often see this in the United States, that the science advisor should be a cabinet level position and it should be sitting with the president and weigh in like the mythology of James Gillian on all topics all the time, um, the reality is it can for a simple reason. The US Congress um, wasn't too happy with uh, Nixon's firing of Ed David. So the US Congress passed a law that created a new entity in the White House. It's the Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP. OSTP is a congressional, congressionally mandated body to sit in the executive office of the president. What that means, in a practical sense, is that the, the head of the Office of Science and Technology Policy can always be called before Congress to testify. The president's close staff and advisors um, operate under something called executive privilege. So if the chief of staff of the White House uh, is called before Congress, and Congress says, what did you talk about with respect to energy policy? and say, well, I choose not to speak to you because I'm invoking executive privilege. It's a conversation between the president and his staff. That doesn't exist for the science advisor. So when uh, people comment that Jack Marburger under Bush or John Holdren under Obama um, doesn't seem to be in the president's inner circle, it's not surprising or unique, um, but it's a necessity. It's just the reality of the position. Uh, so the legislative foundations have prevented that from occurring, even if the president was inclined to do so, and I don't think history suggests any indication. There's only one science advisor who ever worked on a presidential campaign, which is where most of the 
the inner staff of the White House and from that was Wiesner who worked on Kennedy's campaign. Um, none of them have been political uh, people. They've always been from academia or government science. So Jimmy Carter, uh, his science advisor was Frank Press. And uh, Frank Press told us a story that sounds very familiar to uh, much of what we've heard under the Bush and Obama administrations. Uh, so during President Carter's term in office, his political staff proposed that he should commit to a national goal that, so this is 1978. So by the year 2000, the United States would draw 20% of its energy from renewable energy sources, um, other than hydrocarbons and nuclear. They argued for this action on many grounds. Among them, this would improve the president's political standing. It would sound really good to Americans during this time of the high energy prices, the air of oil embargoes, um, to call for 20% renewables. It sounds like it could be uttered today in the US or in Europe, but this was 1978. Uh, these individuals implored Dr. Press to join them in their initiative out of concern that the president might not accept the proposal. The science advisor did not agree with them. Science advisor and staff decided not to support the proposal because the laudable, in their opinion, it was not an achievable goal. So the president was proposing a policy goal that the science advisor and the staff thought was unrealistic, couldn't be achieved. And as you see from this Wall Street Journal story, the president went ahead and proposed something that the science advisors thought was impossible. Why? Because it was politically helpful to do so. So this is from Frank Press. Despite the technical advice, the president decided to accept the proposal of the political staff. He said, the national example, solar panels were installed on the roof of the colony between the president's house and the West Wing to provide hot water for the White House mess. On this and several other occasions, President Carter told us he agreed with our technical evaluation, but would follow another course for political reasons. And then the press says, a reasonable action seems to us for a person in his position. So this is exactly the sort of thing that the Bush administration was criticized for, and now the Obama administration in many cases, that uh, their technical advisors say one thing, but for political reasons, they choose to go another route. Um, and this is another example of what I mean when I say that sometimes um, politics <coughs> wins out, uh, even when you have good technical advice. And no, the United States did not get 20% of its energy from renewable sources by 2000. Um, so is this, so it is, what I'm telling you is this a story of failure? Uh, if you talk to some observers of U.S. science policy, they say, yes, this is, this is failure. Uh, Ed David told us, I think it's a nice summary, uh, the old style science advisor, the distinguished person whom the president looked upon as his house intellectual, to listen to on the complex and new issues at the time. Of course, nuclear arms, nuclear defense, advanced technologies, infectious diseases, and so on, it's not likely to recur soon. Um, I would raise the question whether that old style advisor ever really existed, except in our mythology of science advice. Um, but whatever your views on whether it existed or not, it certainly doesn't exist today. Uh, but I would argue that we've seen in government, and I think it's governments everywhere, um, not just the United States, what I call the triumph of expertise. Um, Daniel Kevlis, who's a historian in 2001, said, uh, issues nowadays are unbelievably pluralistic. There's hardly an issue you can think of that doesn't turn to some extent on technical knowledge. Um, we have experts and expert advisors at all levels of decision making in government and businesses. Um, expertise is everywhere. We, we can't function without expertise. So even though the, the, the science advisor has an exalted role, maybe never lived up to the expectations, um, experts are everywhere. And decision making depends a great deal on experts. So here's some data. Uh, in 1950, about 350 scientists were involved with government advice. Um, what Mullins called friends or friends of friends in an ad hoc, informal basis. Uh, by 2003, the uh, Government Accountability Office documented that there were more than 8,000 scientists on more than 400 <coughs> scientific advisory committees just for the federal government. This does not include scientists who sit on National Research Council committees uh, or all of the experts that sit in government uh, and all of those helpful people who align with NGOs to provide advice to government. Um, we have institutionalized expertise throughout uh, our policy making system. Uh, Jack Marburger told us this. 
I'm going to be asked, this is his reply to the question, you know, do you, you arbitrate scientific questions? You see, most of the decisions that really have technical content get made within department agencies at a level far below the White House. And it's only rarely that science issues or issues with technical content actually come up to the White House for decisions or for policy direction change. Um, so again, depending on your views of what a science advisor does, this is either good news or bad news. Um, what it, it tells us, though, is that we have to think um, much more about science advice as a process that occurs in many different places, many different settings, rather than the idea of the Renaissance man sitting there at the right hand of the decision maker. Uh, I'm not going to say much about Bush and Obama, uh, only to say that the, the issues that have surfaced um, in both administrations reflect many of these tensions that occur um, when you don't pay attention to the process. Um, there was, I'm sure many of you there's a lot of unhappiness with the Bush administration's approach to scientific advice and scientists um, that a lot of people thought it would go away or disappear the minute that Barack Obama was elected. Um, Obama comes to restore the integrity of science. Um, there is even greater disillusionment now among those very same people when it turns out that a lot of the issues that took place in government under Bush still exist under Obama. Um, yes, there's a different orientation of government and different words are said, but the issues of muzzling scientists or rewriting press releases uh, or ignoring technical advice, I'll give you some examples, uh, are just as prevalent today in the Obama administration as the Bush administration. Um, and the scientific community is right now struggling with how to deal with that. Uh, just a few slides to illustrate the, the, the standing of science in the United States is extremely high and has been. And I think it's, um, it's, it's one of those stories that you hear that there's an anti-science um, mood in the electorate or people have lost uh, confidence in the institutions of science. And I don't think it's the case in the US or in Europe. I think science and technology in general, you, know, you get specific issues, you get differences, but in general, um, public support for science is very strong. So this is from the NSF Science and Engineering Indicators that's published every two years. Um, and I'm just going to give you a sampling of data. Um, there's plenty of data out there. Uh, public confidence in institutional leaders. So in the US, military is at the top, but then medicine and science, close behind. Supreme Court, Congress, and the press are down there. Uh, if you talk about individuals, so the prestige of science, scientists in the U.S., firefighters are number one, so first, what are called first responders. <laughs> but scientists and doctor are number two. Congress is down low. Um, but this is the case all the time, for years. Um, and it helps to explain why it is everyone wants to wrap themselves in the cloth of science. They want to tap into that authority. Especially if you're down low on the list, you want to get some of this rubbing off on you. Uh, if you look at how the public thinks about science, is it good? Is it going to help us in society? Um, in the United States, there's, there's long term, there's ups and downs, uh, but long term uh, belief that science in general is a good thing, going back decades. Um, there is variation in the US according to political party, party orientation, even some regional variation. See the same in Europe, um, a general belief, um, really quite strong, that science will improve quality of life. Uh, <coughs> I don't know if you can see it, but Austrians have the lowest, Estonians have the highest, UK is up here near the top. <coughs> now, if you go to specific issues, like energy, or nuclear power, or genetically modified crops, climate change, you get different views. Um, but that's because these questions are about science. They're not about political views on particular issues. So I'm going to uh, spend a few minutes talking about some of the arguments in the framework in my book, The Honest Broker, um, which I have evolved and maybe gotten hopefully a little bit more clear in my own mind since I wrote the book and had a chance to get a lot of feedback on it. Um, and let me start by giving you some words. This is just to explain to you what I mean when I use the words. Um, science is just a systematic pursuit of knowledge. Social science, humanities, 
military intelligence. Um, and I know people write books about what is science and what is not science. Um, and I didn't want to write that book. Um, a policy is a decision. It's a commitment to a course of, of action. And policy has politics. And politics is bargaining, negotiation, and compromise in pursuit of a desired end. Now, this is the democratic version of politics. There's other forms of politics. There's politics of force, politics of coercion. Um, but I'm talking about a particular form of democratic politics. In a lot of situations, the idea of policy and politics are conflated often. And um, politics is the way we get done in the business of society. And I argue that anytime you have two or more people together that have to make a decision, politics necessarily occurs. Um, politics often is used in a pejorative sense. We say that some activity is political, and we mean that it's dirty or bad or somehow unseemly. Uh, so when we talk about the politicization of science, this, this usually is viewed as a negative, that we want to keep science and politics separate. And if science gets politicized, well, then that's a bad thing. Um, I would argue, using this fairly precise definition, that we actually want science to be politicized. What does that mean? That's the use of the systematic pursuit of knowledge as a means of bargaining, negotiating, and compromising the pursuit of desired end. Um, the question isn't if we should politicize science, but how. And there's better and worse ways of politicizing science. Um, so it's, it's very easy, both um, rhetorically and conceptually, to say science and politics should always remain separate. Um, but I don't think it helps us and actually leads to some of the pathologies that I'll talk about. So in the book, I, I have these four categories um, that I, I talk about really only briefly in the book, um, the theoretical orientations. I'm happy to talk more about that if there's any interest. But um, what I'm going to do is illustrate through this analogy that I use. Um, that's, I've seen the word pretty well um, in the introduction to the book to illustrate the different roles. So there's, there's four different roles. They're, of course, ideal types. Um, but I do think they say something about the nature of interaction between someone who's offering advice and someone who's making decisions. Um, and the analogy, while simple, allows us then to start complexifying the relationship between the advisor and the decision maker. Uh, and the analogy is, where should we have dinner? Uh, apparently this is already settled for me for tonight. <laughs> but if you will imagine, uh, I'm, I'm the, the decision maker. I uh, touched down and go, you're the local editor. <coughs> and let's just go through how we might have an interaction with you advising me on where I'm going to have dinner. So I'll go through each of the four cases. And one of the things to recognize is, is what I try to do is to define these four categories um, precisely enough so that, that at least in their ideal type version, um, we can identify what they are so that you can't be more than one of these at the same time in the same context. So while I'll argue that if I'm going to breakfast, you can serve one role, and then if I'm going to dinner, you can serve another. But if the question is just where am I going to dinner tonight, you have to choose. And this is something that I think experts have to realize, that there is no skirting the responsibility to figure out what role you're playing. All right, so the first one's a pure scientist. Let's say that you're, you're, you're up to, on the literature and science technology studies and you realize that values are everywhere. You say, you know, I don't want anything to do with your values-based decisions related to food. I'm just going to give you the facts. And the facts are going to empower you to make the right decision on dinner. So you go on the internet and you see there's this website um, from the US Department of Agriculture that has dietary guidelines for Americans 2010. Um, I don't think there's a 2012 version. Um, which purports to show what constitutes a healthy diet. So you can give this to me and say, here you go. Make a good decision about dinner. This is a version of what's been called the linear model of decision making, the idea that the science comes first, then we have the, the politics of the decision making. So if only we could agree what a healthy meal is, that would empower me uh, to make good decisions about eating. And the nutrition guidelines are a good example of why it is, I don't think that the pure scientist really exists anywhere. Uh, maybe if Bill Gates gives you a big research grant and you go to a deserted island and cut your internet connection, you can do pure research, just follow your curiosity. But the minute you engage 
with decision makers, you're not in that realm of pure research anymore. Um, it may be important, it may be something we want to do in society, but if it is indeed, if we take it seriously pure, then it's not related to decision making. Uh, here's why the nutrition guidelines aren't about pure research. Um, social scientists are, are troublemakers because they study all sorts of processes in society and reveal things that maybe we don't want to reveal. This is from two scholars in the US who have studied the, the nutrition guideline um, development. Gene Goldberg at Tufts um, asked, um, how can the US Department of Agriculture be the lead agency in nutrition education if it's also the organization responsible for protecting the commodity groups? So the USDA is supposed to advance the economic fortune of US farmers and producers. So here's a simple question. Should meat be part of a healthy diet? Should the US government in its dietary guidelines recommend that I eat meat? It, it's very consequential for what I do for dinner tonight. And if you go online and you look for dietary guidelines for vegetarians, you'll find that vegetarians think that you can have a healthy diet without eating meat. Uh, if we're, are we going to use science to resolve that question? No, probably not. The question about whether one eats meat or not is grounded in values and politics and all sorts of messy things that aren't resolved simply by appealing to the facts. So that leaves us with three other categories. Um, and this is where I think a lot of the most important action is in thinking about how to structure your life. So the science arbiter is a bit like the role of a concierge at a hotel. And the defining characteristic of science arbitration is I, as a decision maker, will come to you with questions that you can answer empirically. That's to say, using the tools of science. So I could say, could you tell me three Italian restaurants within walking distance of my hotel? That's a question that could be resolved empirically. Um, I wouldn't say to you, um, what do I feel like tonight? What do I enjoy? Um, I would ask you questions that could be resolved empirically. The science arbitration process is one that has gotten a lot of attention uh, by governments through the creation of science advisory panels that do risk assessments and so on. Um, having a clearly defined mandate, terms of reference that specify what questions are to be asked and answered is key to good science arbitration. Um, it's difficult to do in practice. Uh, Sheila Jasanoff, as I'm sure most of you know, is probably the dean of scholars of science arbitration. Her book, The Fifth Branch, looks at a number of uh, US federal agencies and how they provide advice to decision makers. And what she finds is that, not surprisingly, there's a lot of politics that goes on in the process of arbitrating scientific questions. Um, but if you're like me and you believe that our knowledge of the world actually can contribute to better policy making, then there are cases where you really want to have the ability to elicit what experts think on a particular topic, even in the presence of ignorance and uncertainty and so on. So doing science arbitration well is, is important. Uh, here's an agreement of where the, the situation hasn't worked so well. In the United States, uh, really, for much of the last decade, there's been a debate over uh, what's called Plan B, the day after pill, so-called emergency contraception. Under the Bush administration, uh, a federal advisory committee uh, ruled that there was no threshold at which the drug was safe to use versus unsafe. So that means that a 13-year-old girl has the same risk profile as a 25-year-old woman. And the Bush administration, in all its wisdom, said, well, we don't believe that science. Obviously, obviously, there's a threshold. 18 years old is the threshold. Um, that would get around the issues with parental consent and the abortion debate in the United States. The Bush administration is heavily criticized for being anti-science, not listening to its advisors. Um, now, lo and behold, just a few months ago, um, the Obama administration faced this same issue. Um, and the Obama administration, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, which oversees the Food and Drug Administration, uh, Kathleen Sebelius, uh, she heard back from the advisory committee, there's no age threshold for morning after pill. Uh, there's no, no, no scientific basis for drawing a line. She said, well, obviously this is wrong. Everyone knows that girls are different than women. And we're going to create a threshold. I think it's 17. There's an election coming up. The Obama administration doesn't want to be talking about parental consent 
birth control pills available at drugstores for young girls. So everyone in this case said it's an issue of science. The science made us do it. And when the science comes back with answers that are inconvenient or not welcomed, um, they contest the science. Rather than saying, in both cases, abortion is contested in the United States and parents have rights, so we're going to use our values to put a threshold at 17 or 18 years, everyone appeals to the science. Uh, and this is one of the risks to effective science arbitration, is that um, we put our politics onto the processes of science, rather than simply taking the scientific advice as it's given and clearly explaining that decision makers make decisions, um, not scientific advisors. So the issue advocate, this is the third uh, category. Uh, the defining characteristic of the issue advocate it's a desire to reduce the scope of choice of the decision maker. Often, the issue advocate wants to reduce it down to a single preferred option. So maybe I come into Edinburgh and you uh, give me this map McDonald's. Maybe you, you like McDonald's or you have stock in the company or whatever. Your cousin works there. Uh, but the point here is that you're trying to limit my scope of choice. Uh, and let me say, this is something that's going to be featured in the next edition. Issue advocacy is one of the most important functions of a healthy democracy. This is how citizens appeal for recourse or redress of issues they care about to their government. Uh, this is how we balance out the fact that we have different values on different topics. So some of you might like wind energy, some of you might not like wind energy. We go out and we fight over it, we make arguments, we write letters to the um, newspaper and so on. We elect people that we, we will carry forward our view. Uh, let me say there's nothing misleading or wrong about this map if, if Google drew it properly. Um, but it does give me a, a very limited scope of information related to my choices. Uh, with the idea that if you give me this information for whatever reason, maybe just the cost of search, uh, I'll say, all right, I'll go to McDonald's. <coughs> Uh, for a long time, the role of advocacy in science has been discussed and debated. This is from 1976. Uh, the, the president of the U.S. National Academy of Scientists said, we've learned that the scientist advocate on either side of such a politicized debate would be anything. It's likely to be more advocate than scientists, and this has undoubtedly altered the public view of the nature of the scientific endeavor and the personal attributes of scientists. Um, so there is kind of a norm in the scientific community that that advocacy is um, not to be done. This seems to be bro broken down or at least bifurcated these days because you have issues like climate change and GM crops and nuclear power. Um, those are the most prominent where scientists are more than willing to jump into the advocacy space. Um, there's less of the stricture against it. All right, so, so contrast the issue advocate with the honest broker. Now, I illustrate the honest broker with a guidebook. So you may say, um, I can't tell you where to go to dinner, but I can tell you what your choices are. And the difference between the issue advocate who seeks to reduce your scope of choice is that the honest broker seeks to expand or at least clarify your scope of choice. Now, if you think about it at the theoretical maximum, if you were to give me, let's say, a booklet with all of the restaurants in Edinburgh that I could conceivably have dinner at, I would starve to death before I went through and read them all. Obviously, at the limit, the honest broker is unworkable and impractical. But I would, would posit that there's a big difference in the nature of our relationship if you give me a map of McDonald's versus a guidebook. So the difference between issue advocacy and honest broker is best thought of as a spectrum. Shades of gray. You can be more or less one or the other. Um, but it's important to understand that you can't be both at the same time. You cannot both reduce my scope of choice and expand it at the same time. Now, there's different levels of, um, of decision making. There are means and ends. So I've already settled that I'm going to dinner. If you want me to go shopping for clothes or go to a museum, I've already taken that off the list. So there, there is a need to restrict the, the, the scope. Um, 
And sometimes that scope has to do with a restriction of ends to be sought, uh, and sometimes the means that are used to achieve those ends. And you could be an issue advocate for ends, so dinner, you're advocating that I go to dinner, at the same time be an honest broker with respect to means. What are the restaurants I could go to? And where advisors sit in that hierarchy of ends and means is, is really a political choice that has to be negotiated with decision makers. Uh, one of the questions that comes up that's a difficult one is, uh, let's say the government needs a science arbiter, and the uh, government asks its experts, tell us what the uh, economic, your best estimate of the economic cost of emissions trading is going to be. Now, the experts could gather up the, the, the range of ex expertise, economists and others answer that question. But what happens in situations when the experts think that the questions they're asked are the wrong questions? What if the experts think that emissions trading is a bad idea and they, that governments should be doing something else? The answer that I have to that is that we need people in different roles in the advisory process. That you do want some experts who stand ready to answer questions that other experts may think are dumb or the wrong questions. Um, simply because that's how governments work. At the same time, you want other experts who are out there um, either critiquing ends or means and providing a broader set of options. A healthy advisory system has all four of these boxes populated. And we get into trouble when um, we either overlook one or try to do one when in the presence of another. So if you are an advocate in the role of a science arbiter, um, you're probably not helping the process. Yeah, we didn't do that. Thanks. Uh, so here's a former chief scientific advisor um, in the UK since 1990 who, who very much expressed this is the, the opening quote I have in the book, the View of the Honest Broker. The role of the scientist is not to determine which risks that we're taking or deciding what choices we should take. The scientist must be involved in indicating what the possible choices, constraints, and possibilities are. The role of the scientist is not to decide between the possibility to determine what the possibilities are. Uh, one of the critiques of my book, uh, it's actually come out of the, the natural science community, is that uh, the recommendation that we should have honest brokers is anti-science. Why is it anti-science? Because in asking advisors to provide a range of options, you are empowering decision makers to make decisions. Uh, and you are asking scientists to step back from coercing or trying to convince in particular cases. Um, I think that's, it's, uh, I would disagree with the critique, but I think it's right on. But there are some instances where the role of advisors is to advise, to empower decision makers. There are other situations where advisors will want to try to advocate or compel a particular decision. Um, and ultimately, a lot of the debate about what the proper role between experts and decision makers is um, hinges on how we think about democracy and what we think of democracy is. Um, and I have had colleagues who come up to me, particularly in the context of climate change, who have done some work, who said um, the issue of climate change is too important for democracy. That um, decisions should be made on an authoritative basis by the people who know best. Um, one of the tenets of about democracy that I hold is that democracy means that people are allowed to make decisions that experts consider to be bad decisions. That's what it means for people to self-govern. Not everyone agrees. Um, so your view on if honest brokers are appropriate and what situations they are appropriate really depends upon how you feel about certain issues and how we trade off democratic governance versus authoritarian decision making. We all use honest brokers. Um, if you go to a travel website, um, to see what your choices are, how much to pay, where you can go. Um, you go there because it tells you what your choices are. So, so they exist, and they, in some cases, um, they even exist in government. I should say that, that if there are some situations where experts don't like an unsproken because it diminishes their authority, there's other cases where policymakers don't like unsproken. Um, because as in the case of the morning after pill of the US, if you simply say, here's your choices, then the decision maker clearly is the one responsible for making the choice. 
And it's very easy to avoid accountability by saying, that expert committee told me to do it. I'm going to fire my expert because that, that didn't work out so well. Uh, as we learned from the presidential science advisors, science advisors are very useful um, because they can take political blame sometimes uh, and take some of that accountability away. Uh, one of the themes I talk about in the book and I'll talk about a lot more about in the, um, in the revision is what I call stealth issue advocacy. Um, science does have such uh, authority in our society that it's very easy to say, well, I'm just acting as a pure scientist or I'm just answering scientific questions. Uh, I'm not advocating a particular course of action. When in reality, uh, there's very strong advocacy going on. This has the potential to eat away the credibility of individual scientists and individual organizations. And, um, maybe one of the things we could talk about is how organizations like the Royal Society, like the National Academy of Sciences in the US, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, some government advisory committees have actually lost a lot of credibility broadly in society uh, or in certain cases with certain elements of society because of their engagement in advocacy. To give you an example, in the United States, the issue of climate change has become so politicized, and I think it's, there's similar echoes in the UK, um, that you can predict someone's view on the science simply by their political affiliation, um, which has everything to do with politics and nothing to do with science. So there's a lot of questions that this raises uh, for the scientists. And I do focus a lot of my attention on experts, because I think we have the ability to, to structure our relationship with decision makers to some degree. Um, I'm not hopeful that um, the nature of politics is ever going to change in a way that um, the heroic, the, the, the mythological view has of uh, putting experts in roles of authority. Uh, but even so, the mythology lives on. And we, we live in a society where there is this idea that we get the, the great and the good science advisor sitting with the, uh, decision makers. And this is from the House of Lords report that came out end of February uh, that recommended that, that the UK strengthen the chief scientific advisor mechanism by uh, putting, uh, putting a chief scientific advisor in, in each government department. Uh, I'm going to talk about having a chief social scientist in the UK government. And my thinking is, well, what's next? Chief political scientist, chief sociologist, chief life scientist, chief biologist. Um, where does it end? But once you start critiquing that idea, it ends up back at the top. European Commission has a new chief science advisor uh, from around these parts, uh, whose main job seems to be in public communication, actually. Uh, and even now, the United Nations has committed to having a chief scientific advisor. Um, pretty soon, we just won't even need the politicians and decision makers anymore because we're not the scientists all at the reins of power. All right, I'm at the end. So thank you. Uh, I wish you can find me. A lot of papers and issues discussed. And uh, if you don't know about my blog, come visit it, where I discuss these issues. Try to raise some trouble from time to time. Thank you. Thanks so much.